Uh, we started talking about the comfort of the scriptures, and then uh, last week we started talking about the comfort of God and where comfort comes from. And uh, we're people that really like creature comforts. I know everybody likes creature comforts. We like to be comfortable. But what happens is when things get uncomfortable for us, what happens? We need comforting, don't we? So when, uh, when you, when you <laughs> we were talking about babies yesterday crying and how you can't get upset with a baby when they're, when they're crying because you have to be patient with them. And that's how they communicate. They, don't, they can't talk to you. They don't have a communication skill that way. Now, when they get, you know, four, five, six years old and they're still crying, then you get a guy to deal with it. But, you know, <laughs> not when they're newborns, okay? So newborns, that's what they do, okay? They cry. And sometimes they cry loud when they want what they want. So you got to give it to them. you got to help them. you got to comfort them. They can't just run to the icebox and get their bottle, okay? It can't happen. So there are things that have to be done for folks, and this is part of the ministry. And even though when you begin to talk to people, you find out that many people are very uncomfortable with God, and uh, they don't want to talk about him. Uh, Frank was giving a testimony this morning about a friend that just passed away who originally when Frank would uh, talk to him about the Lord, he didn't want to hear about it. And, and that's true. Many times people do not want to hear about God. They don't want to talk about God. They, they think usually you're going to talk about the same thing they've been hearing all their life about God. So if they're Roman Catholic or if they're in some denominational system or if they've been in some sort of thing where they were kind of brought through a, a religious system, they don't want to hear more of that because they're not making any distinction between what you're going to say to them and what's been said to them all that time. So they're afraid, okay, and, and they're, they're kind of bored with it. They're, they're over it. They don't want to be a part of it anymore. And what it is, it's not so much that they don't want to have anything to do with God. They're really getting turned off on religion. And religion does that to people. And uh, the, the question is, when you talk to people, you know, you, you have to be able to meet them where they are. And in that comfort zone, you have to be able to teach them that he is the God of all comfort. Uh, Romans chapter 15, and Paul talks about this with the scriptures, and this is what we have to be skilled in so that we can use the scriptures to comfort, comfort people. Look at Romans chapter 15, and before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the scriptures and the comfort and the patience that we get by studying them. We thank you, Lord, even more so how effective they are by us learning them and applying them and being able to teach them on the spot to people that need this help. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. He says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, people have to be patient with you if they're going to learn the Bible. They can't learn it all in one hour. I've got a message I've been working on, and this has really been a task. I, I'm not done with this message yet. I've worked more on this one message than I think I have in probably a long time on any one message. And it's how to go through the Bible in an hour and explain the whole thing. Now, if you start trying to tackle a subject that wide, you've got to be very selective and very careful about how you talk about things. And what happens is you try, you try, <laughs> you try to do that, and it's very hard to do. I've seen it done, and uh, it can be done. But I, I'm thinking of an overview. And as you do that, you realize that sometimes people... They, they need to see the big picture in the thing. They need to see what's going on in the big picture. Well, when you start talking to lost people and you try, start trying to comfort lost people, what's the big picture for them? Well, they don't, they don't have a big picture. They don't have a view of this at all. In their mind, they're confused about so many different things, so you have to help them along, okay? And you have to kind of lead them down the path and help them, and that's why you hear people say, you know, Somebody led me to Christ. Well, they get led there by somebody who's skilled to do that. And so if, if you're going to talk to somebody who, who has been in church all their life and the only comfort verse they know is thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, then you know they're in trouble. Because the God of all comfort is not the person uh, that they've been taught about. They've been taught another Jesus. They've been taught the Jesus of folklore. They've been taught the Jesus that Satan wants to present, okay? And when these ministers of righteousness transform themselves into angels of light, they're not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
they're talking about something else. And another Jesus, another spirit, it all comes from another gospel message. And so what happens is they get confused, and they get fed up with it, and then they get, well, I guess you might say a little discouraged. And uh, I think that when you think about comforting people, you always want to think of it in the context of comforting saved people because they can be comforted, you know? Take a look at Luke chapter 16. Uh, Jason went to my passage this morning, and I just, I was thanking God he had run out of time because he was going to walk all over my verses, and uh, he was, he went in the end, so he didn't have any time to develop it, but I'm glad he went there because this particular passage is a great passage about comfort, and you, you know, you don't always think about this whole thing about comforting somebody who's in hell, but at the same time, you realize that when you're talking to lost people, what, what are you going to talk about to begin with? I mean, how are you going to start a conversation with somebody if you don't talk about condemnation? Condemnation is, is really where they need to be, because some people don't think they're condemned. Some people don't think they're guilty. Some people don't think they've got a problem with sin. Some people have to be taught that. Most people do not. Uh, I would say that generally when you talk to lost folks, they are well aware that they're lost, okay? However, admitting that and talking about it openly in public is not something that they always want to discuss. Condemnation is a big issue. Now, I want to read the story to you real quick. Go to Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So Abraham and Lazarus are on one side, and the lost man is over in the other side, and they can't get to each other. Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, this man's dead. Now he's having a conversation with the patriarch Abraham and Lazarus. And by the way, Lazarus was somebody that he refused to comfort. He refused to help him. He refused to give him medical treatment. Okay? He's got sores on him. And what do you have to do when you got sores on you? You've got to dress them and take care of them. All this guy could afford was dogs licking them. That's all he could afford. He's not got any food. He's not got any. He's a beggar. And he's begging... According to Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, he is begging according to the law of Moses. God makes provision under the law for a people who are destitute. He has his own program for them. And this person was rich. He fares sumptuously every day, it says. And this poor guy is sitting outside his house begging just for some basic help. And what happens? He won't do it. He's got plenty of resources. He could set the guy up in his own place if he wanted to. Won't do it. He won't give him medical attention. He's not going to help him. He has no compassion for him. He has nothing. He just, he just condemns him as a beggar that's worthless. He won't work. He's got problems. He's not part of my class. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And all of a sudden, you see class distinction right here. You see the poorest guy in town and the richest guy in town, and here's what happens to him. One guy goes to hell. The other guy goes to heaven. Okay? Or paradise, we would say. Now, when he wants this water, he's looking to get some relief from the torment in this flame, he says. Now, look at verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime... How would you like to be told when you're in hell to remember your lifetime? Would, you not indicate, would that not indicate to you that you could remember your lifetime? Now, that's what you're stuck with, you and your memories of your lifetime, okay? Now, that's not a good thing. He says, 
that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Oh, by the way, from you he got them, okay, evil things. But now he is what? What happened to Lazarus? He's comforted. He's, he's got the ultimate comfort. He's in paradise. This is exactly the same thing that happened to the man on the cross, the thief on the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Where did, the, where did the Lord Jesus Christ go when he died? He went to paradise. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He went there. You know, this is a place. This is not a figment of somebody's imagination. This is a real place. And he says, and thou, he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Now we know why they would come over to see Abraham. They want to get out of the torments. But why would anybody want to go from paradise over to torments? Well, the minister to him. Don't you think Lazarus would go do that if he could? If Lazarus could go over there and not be touched by all that and take the water to him, don't you think he would? I think he would. He says, he says then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, Father Abraham, who is he, that's who he's talking to, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren. Now he's worried about his brethren. Now he's worried about somebody else. Now he's got some compassion for somebody, his own family, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Well, he doesn't want them to come there. Regardless of what he might have had against his brothers, or regardless of what they went through going up, growing up, or no matter what it is that was ever between them, he doesn't want them there with him. Okay? Now, what does that tell you about the place? And what he thinks about it. Well, it's pretty clear. It's a bad place to be. And he says, And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now, that's interesting. Because as soon as he starts talking about Moses and the prophets, what do they represent? What does Moses and the prophets represent to the Jew? The word of God. Moses writes the first five books of the Bible. And the prophets likewise wrote after him. And Moses himself was a prophet. And he says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear him, them, excuse me, verse 30. And what does he respond in? His nature really hasn't changed. He says, and he said, nay. Now we say no. <laughs> but they say nay. If you say nay, you mean no way. He said, nay, Father Abraham. So he begins next in verse 30, arguing with Abraham. So now he, he hasn't been listening to the law of Moses all along and the verses that teach him to help the beggar. Now he's in hell and he won't listen to Abraham himself personally. And he knows why he's there. You see, he knows what paradise is. And he knows he's not in it. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And Jason brought out a good point today about Moses being a type of Christ. Uh, Christ goes to them, uh, he comes to them in his incarnation, and then he's also preached to them for a year between Pentecost and Stephen uh, in, in resurrection, and they don't believe him. They don't believe him over here, they don't believe him over here, and by the way, they're not believing it here either. People don't believe this. The amount of people that are being saved today is fantastic. I'm, I'm happy for everybody that gets saved. But in, in, in comparison to 7 billion people, folks, it's a very small amount. Now, I know that God's people uh, are doing what they can. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this. They're, 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 they're so inadequately equipped in their own training and their understanding of the gospel of the grace of God that we see at the end of Paul's ministry, at the end of his life, when he's dying, when he starts making statements to Timothy, hey, all in Asia have forsaken me. Only Luke is with me. We know it's trouble. Okay? The only man I got with me is my doctor. That's it. Luke wouldn't leave him. 
So it, it doesn't fall down around the ears of Christendom in over 2,000 years. It falls down around the ears of Paul while he's still alive. And all we've seen is the rubble. And the rubble had, uh, it's pretty much, it, it's just been going on since then. There is a very quiet, small working in building this body of Christ. This is not stadium mentality stuff. It doesn't mean that it, it couldn't be that way. It just, what it is, is it's very, very slowly, very silently, and, and, and very, very methodically being built. One person at a time, okay? One individual at a time. I think one of the great tragedies of anybody as a member of the body of Christ that would get saved and live their entire time and never have a record of ever leading anybody to Christ, what a tragedy that is. And it happens all the time. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What are they going to learn from Moses and the prophets? Well, the first thing they're going to learn, learn from the schoolmaster, turn over to Romans 3, they're going to learn that they need a redeemer. When you learn from Moses and the prophets, turn to Romans chapter 3, Paul has been preaching since Romans 1.18 all the way to Romans 3.18, he uh, has been preaching about condemnation. So as you start to go through this process of talking to a lost person about their condemnation, trying to get them to this point of talking about their justification, you're going to have to know Romans 1.2.3. It is as easy as 1.2.3. But I'm going to tell you, there's some, there's some things in Romans 1, 2, and 3 that take a little bit of thought and a little bit of time to work through. And Romans chapter 3, verse 19, this is very interesting how he says this. He goes on, from, from verse 18, he's describing those who have been pretty much denying everything uh, concerning God. And, and these are what we consider the, the picture of the lost. In verse 18, verse 18, he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. In verse 19, he says, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So the law of Moses first brings you to a point of understanding that you're guilty before God. Verse 20, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So when you're going to bring a person to condemnation and understand, I don't mean condemning them individually. I'm talking about teaching them about the condemnation that is on them already. They are under the sentence of condemnation. They're under the sentence of, of eternal death. They're under the sentence under that, and the question is not whether you're under it or not. The question is how are you going to get out from underneath it? That's the question. And who's going to lead you out of this furnace and bring you away from it so you don't have to burn, okay? Now, getting these people out is a process that really, I, I do believe that it takes skill and learning to perfect. It is not something that w when I first started getting into the message of grace and started learning this, I had no idea how to do this. I, I, was, I was trying my best to lead people to Christ, and I was doing it. But once I began to learn some of these things in Romans 1, 2, and 3, my, my whole ministry took off in, in a way that I never could imagine. Because then I could begin to show people better how they need to look at God and His Word. And the first thing you have to learn is you're condemned. The first thing you have to admit is I'm lost. I need a Savior. But that doesn't do any good if you're by yourself and nobody's talking to you about it. People are walking around thinking that already. They know they're lost. But who's going to help them? The question is, how can you be in a possession of a, of, of a message that takes people from hell and puts them into paradise, into heaven, and takes them and puts them into the body of Christ in our particular dispensation? How can you be in possession of that information and not speak about it? That's what bothers me so much. The, the issue of the evangelism and the issue of trying to get people saved is often put off because... What? It's not just because I don't have the training. Many of you are well trained in this. You've heard this over and over and over. And yet, there's that hesitancy. 
And uh, we'll talk about that in ETC. That's the fear. And the fear has to be overcome. Look at uh, Luke chapter 16. When you think about your own fear and your own misgivings and your own fear to go out and talk to people and your fear of embarrassment, your fear of whatever, think about the fear of being in hell for eternity and not being able to get out. Think about that. And what he says here, he says, Moses and the prophets, they have the information that, that they need. Your brothers can hear Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In this whole concept of Moses and the prophets that Paul's talking about, it's, it's not only condemnation that's been taught, and the schoolmaster brings them to Christ and teaches them the lesson of the schoolmaster, but there's a confirmation, and the confirmation is what? Go back to Romans 3 and look at it again. There's a confirmation that takes place that we need to really pay attention to. Okay, because now we see the condemnation. It's, it's already been demonstrated for 64 verses. And now the turning verse in the entire book of Romans begins in verse 21 with this phrase. I've told you before, there's 13 of these but nows that Paul speaks of. And this particular one is, I think, one of the single most important ones because of the subject matter it's associated with. Verse 21, he says... But now the righteousness of God without the law is what? Manifested. Now, it has been demonstrated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is demonstrated in the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to Paul with a message that demonstrates that here's the message for you without any works involved whatsoever for any religious activity. Now, Israel never got saved by works, but they did have to be involved in works because that was part of their sanctification. They had to be separate. They had a religious system. We do not have any of that attached to our message. Our message is completely free. You know what you're supposed to do with works? Cease. That's what you're supposed to do with works. You're supposed to quit your quasi-religious activity when you're a lost person, you're supposed to cease from trying to work your way to heaven and you're supposed to just sit down, shut up and listen to what God says about you getting saved because he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Now he says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What did the law do? It condemned them and it was a testimony against them the whole time they were under it. Okay? The prophets wrote, and every single time they wrote, it was exactly the same thing. And what did they do with the men and their writings? They cut their writings up, threw them in the fire, the case with Jehudi and Jeremiah, and they also killed the prophets. They sought Isaiah in two. Now, what do you do with people like that? The most religious people that ever lived on this planet put the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's no surprise, because the first man ever born of a woman was a murderer. So where are we in this picture? The, the 1,500 years from Moses to Christ settles it, folks, for the entire world, and forever and ever it settles the issue that the witness against the law as a means of justification is not possible. Man cannot pull himself up by his own bootstraps. Any son of Adam needs a redeemer. When God found Adam and Eve, where were they? Where do guilty people go? Where do, where do men who are outlaws go? They go to their hideout. <laughs> where, were, where were Adam and Eve? They're over here hunkered down behind the tree going, you know, like that. And they've been messing around trying to fix this problem by sewing these little fig leaves together. Now, seriously, they're going to try to fix it? They're going to try to fix it? You remember when they did what they did, they weren't even sinners. They were sinless when they did what they did. But the problem isn't what they did. The problem is you're in them. That's your problem. Romans 5 says, by one man sin entered into the world, and so death by sin. And so when you look at what Adam had, he had an opportunity. He blew it. The problem is you were in Adam. Somebody said, you know, we're made in the image of God. I said, not so. 
Adam was made in the image of God, and that image was a face. Now you're made in the image of Adam. And in Adam, all die. So when you look at this problem, you say, okay, we've got the problem solved now because now that Moses and the prophets have completely testified that the law cannot do what people think it should do for them. You cannot be justified by the same law that condemns you. You cannot be condemned by a law and then turn around and use that same law to save yourself under a law. Look at Romans cha or look at Acts chapter 13. It's not legally possible. Acts chapter 13. Um, now Jason used this today also in his prayer. And, and it's a great verse. This is one of my favorite verses. Now, in Acts 13, you've got the same kind of little synopsis uh, that you see in Acts 7 with Stephen, only this is Paul's kind of version of it. But notice what he says. Verse 38. Be it known unto you, brethren, men, uh, therefore men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law of Moses cannot justify a single individual. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan, and he's, he's needing help, and what, what happened when the when the religious leaders came across him. They crossed away from him. Yeah, they crossed the street on the other side. You know why? Because there was nothing they could do. They represented the religious system of Israel, and it wouldn't help the man. You see, their religion was not designed to help them. It was designed to condemn them and bring them to a point where they could believe that they had a redeemer. They were being asked and being shown to believe exactly what Job had believed several hundred years later or earlier. And Job says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and will stand on the earth in the last day. Job knew his Redeemer lived. He understood redemption. Redemption is when somebody pays to get you out of the prison. That's what it is. And redemption means you're bought with a price. Doesn't Paul say that about us as believers? You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. So you don't, it, your life doesn't really belong to you anymore, does it? You're a son of God now. You belong to him. And my suggestion to all people that are in the body of Christ, you need to obey your heavenly father. That's what you need to do. And otherwise, you take your place with those children of disobedience in Ephesians 2, and you start being practically like them. Even though you're not in the same group, you're, you're not going to hell. But the thing is, if you're, what's the difference between a person who doesn't give the gospel and, and try to lead people to Christ and to help comfort people about them being lost and a person who doesn't even know it? If you know it and don't do it, are, are you the same as a person who doesn't know anything about it at all? I mean, think about it for a second. If a person doesn't know anything about this, okay, they can't, do, they can't help you if you're lost. But if you learn this and then you go out in your life and still don't do anything with it, what practical effect or what practical difference is there? There's no difference. The difference is when you learn it and then what? Walk in it. <laughs> You've got to put it into shoe leather. You've got to practice it. You've got to be a part of it. You've got to make it happen. Now... God will do that through you, but there needs to be a motive. Uh, let me show you the motive, okay? Here's where you get your motive. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter, there's only one motive for this. I mean, you can see it in different places, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's only one motive. What is the, what is the motive? Second Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, look, man, everything I do, I do for you guys. Okay? Everything I do in my ministry, I'm doing it for you. Okay? Everything. Everything. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
That's where the microscope, that's where the magnifying glass gets put on what you did in your ministry. He says that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, I know people have been, for years, I've had to deal with that verse with people, and they say, well, it's good and bad. That must mean good or evil. No, it's talking about good or bad things that you do where? In your body. Now, where do you carry out the ministry of your, your life? Where is your ministry carried out? I don't know about you, but mine carried out right here in my body. Okay, I walked here today. I drove here. I came here. I, I, I'm, I'm inside my body. If you want to meet Rush, you've got to come and, and have to look at this to, to meet me, but this isn't me. This is just what I live in. Okay, this is my little shack I live in, and this is my home, away from home. Now, what I do in my service for the Lord Jesus Christ has, as, as a believer is to build up some capacity in me so that I can be useful when God finally puts me into the place where he really is going to use me. This is all training down here in the dispensation of grace. It's all training. And the training time is going to be useful for you in the future. And if you do something that's bad, that is, preach Israel's program instead of this program, <laughs> or try to bring this program from here over to here, or try to bring this program from here over to here, or even just live here by yourself and don't even worry about anybody else and say, well, I'm just going to live unto myself because that's what I'm going to do because that's what I'm going to do. That's all I want to do. And what happens here is you've got to remember the capacity is going to be utilized and in order to know what is useful in eternity, God's going to sort it out. And you know how he sorts it out? He's going to sort it out. He says he's going to sort every man's work of what sort it is. So when he sorts it out, what's the best way to sort something? Like if I give you a bunch of scrap metal, say gold, for instance, and you've thrown all this stuff into a pot, what's the best way to get all the junk out of that? Put a fire under it. And start it boiling. And get it to a temperature where it'll boil. Okay? Because you can boil gold. Now, once you get it to that temperature, what happens? All the junk comes to the top. It's called dross. And they scoop it off. Right? And what's left? Pure. It's pure. Everything you have left is pure. And that pure gold is usable. We don't want the junk in the gold. We want to get all the junk out. That's exactly what happens to Israel over here in the tribulation. He takes them through the tribulation. Two-thirds of them die. What's that? That's the dross. The pure part of them come through, and they get an opportunity. Well, we get an opportunity now. But Mr. Stam said it best. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done by Christ will last. And as you look at this, you say, okay, he's going to judge me, whether it was good service or bad service, he's going to judge me, and now I'm going to have to deal with that, for we must all appear, he says. Now, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, I don't believe this terror here is... is is talking about terror towards us. He's talking about knowing the terror of the Lord in general, okay, because it is going to be a terrible thing when the Lord Jesus Christ comes by. That's why it's called the great and terrible day of the Lord, okay? Now, he's not a terrible person, but he can bring some terrible things on people, and hell is one of them. And uh, you can have that discussion with him in eternity about why he designed to do that, why he desired and designed to create it, but the Bible says explicitly that hell was designed for the devil and his angels, Man was not, it was not man's intent to go to hell. Man's intent was to be put on the earth, be a prophet, priest, and king, and rule the earth, and take the earth back from Satan, and let God rule there with man. What happened? Adam was knocked out in the first round because he what? He listened to his wife, and he made a bad decision. And after he did that, the whole thing fell apart, and now we're dealing with the cleanup. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, how do you do that? He says, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you uh, occasion to glory on our behalf, 
that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whither we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whither we be sober, it is for your cause. Great definition of sober there. Not being beside yourself. Not being out of control. <laughs> Paul got out of control. And, the, and the, the, the king said, you're beside yourself. You're crazy, man. And, you know, sometimes we do that. And I found myself getting pretty excited yesterday talking to a man. And uh, he said, he told me when he left, he, says, he said, Russ, this is the best thing I've heard all year. And he says, only one problem. I live in Newport Ritchie, 35 miles away. I said, well, that's only a 35-minute drive from here. I said, don't let that stop you. Okay, we've had, I drove to Tampa for five, six years, 60 miles, okay. That's not a problem. 35 miles is nothing when it comes to hearing this. You know why? Because this changes your life. It changed your life when you went from being under condemnation to justification, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, and you can't forget that. He says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, notice what he says. He says in verse 13, for whither we be beside ourselves, it is to God. It's for God's purpose. For, or whither we be sober, it is for your cause. We're trying to give you what God is wanting you to have. In verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That's the motive. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, what's the conclusion? then all must have been dead. All must have needed dying for. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, does he die for everybody in the world, past, present, and future? Yes. Now, now you've got to study it to figure out how that's applied to these folks back here. It's pretty easy to understand how it applies to us, and it's also pretty easy to figure out how, to, how it applies to these people over here. The fact is, there isn't any other way for anybody to get to God except through that cross. That's it. There is no other way. If there was another way, he wouldn't have had to die. So as we look at this, we're, we are entrusted with a message that, that really is of, of, so imp, it's of such importance and so important that we really can't walk away from it. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, this is a fact, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So who are you supposed to live unto? You're supposed to live unto him. And if you live unto him, you're not living unto yourself. And that means what? What does that really mean when, when Paul says it? Does it mean you can't own a home, you can't drive a car, you can't get married, you can't have children? Does it mean all that? No. It means that you're to structure into your life the work of the ministry as the central core of what you're doing, not a part of it. It's not a satellite that comes around you, and every once in a while you beep, 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 and you grab some of it. You're, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to make the ministry your life. Look over at Colossians chapter 3. I mean, this is a good question. Colossians 3 starts out with what? If ye, be, if ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above. Well, well, what are you looking for when you're seeking things above? You're looking for the ministry from the Lord Jesus Christ that comes down to Paul from where? From above. The heavenly things. The new position. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. There's the ministry right there. There's where, where your Savior sits. That's what's really happening Set your affection on things above. Notice what he says, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Praise the Lord. I mean, that's what's happening. Look over to Ephesians, or uh, Philippians. You see the same exact thing in Philippians, and it's done this way. In chapter 1, Christ is our life, the whole chapter, okay? 
Then in chapter 2, Christ is our mind, the way we're supposed to be thinking. Christ is our mind. Okay? Chapter 3, Christ is our goal. That's our final goal. Everything is to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's the process we're in. And then the strength to get it all done is in chapter 4. You notice the verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's a famous verse that people use, mostly used out of context. Okay? But if you look at what we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be taking these people through the book of Romans. Justification, Romans 1, 2, and 3. Assurance and security, 4, 5. Sanctification and understanding real godliness, not religion, chapters 6, 7, and 8. Identity as sons of God, mainly beginning in chapter 8, but also 9, 10, and 11. Now, how does your identity come to you in Romans 9, 10, 11, talking about Israel? Well, it teaches you who you aren't first. See, how many of you have ever heard anybody say, we're spiritual Israel? They think God's done with Israel, and now the church, the body of Christ, has taken the place of Israel, and now they're trying to take all these things over here, and they're just trying to embrace them and make them work and do all these things. Good luck with that. It won't work. First of all, this has got a bloodless gospel message over here. You can't preach that today. You can't preach the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ until somebody explains to you what it's for. Okay, That's Paul's program. So all of a sudden, when you begin to go through this, you begin to see in 9, 10, 11 of, of Romans that parenthetical chapter uh, trio there that you're not Israel. The greatest mistake that Moses ever made, and he spent 40 years in the wilderness hiding from God on the backside of the desert, it says, from 40 till 80, he hid back there for 40 years because he thought God was through with Israel. All because Israel rejected him. What a huge mistake that was. What a terrible mistake that was. And the church, the body of Christ over here, has been making the same mistake for 2,000 years. God's done with Israel, now we're Israel. So we've got to take all Israel's promises. Satan's go, they got it, they got it. He, they're getting it, they're taking the bait. He sets it, boom, brings them in the boat, now you're captive. Can't do a thing. Just flipping around. Not, not, in, not even working anywhere near where you're supposed to be working. You're over here, functioning over here. See, Romans to Philemon is the explanation, as I've told you a million times, it is the explanation to what goes on back here and what is coming over here, and also, of course, especially today. It helps you stay out of these areas. In terms of application, you can go and use these things. Certainly, certainly there are doctrinal things that you must tie together with what we have. Obviously, the whole thing is tied together. But when you start trying to take specific things and apply them in your life over here today, you're going to have a problem. Okay, and, and those things are corrected by knowing who you are. Because now, what? You're part of this program where you're declared to be the son of God. Now, the, the, the sons of God. Also, what comes is the fellowship and the unity. That's chapters uh, 12 through 16. That's living life in the body of Christ. And so our responsibility to the lost is to be able to know that book of Romans so well that we can take them through here and teach them that, hey, there's comfort in condemnation. And the comfort comes from knowing the way out of it. When you know, you how, to, when you know how you can be saved. There is comfort in justification because now you can learn that there's a way for you to be just before God without any religious activity, without any works, without any of that, that you're justified freely. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse 21. He says, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow. What a great thing to, to be made the righteousness of God. Have you ever thought about how you would get the righteousness from God? Well, Paul identifies it in Romans chapter 5 as what? You remember the story of the woman at the well when he's talking to her about the gift? He doesn't even explain it, but he does, he does talk about it. The context is the living water. And she's confusing the, the drinking water from the well 
with him as being the living water, but he speaks to her about the gift. He just mentions the gift. Israel never understood righteousness as a gift from God. They never understood the concept. Well, in Romans chapter 5, look what Paul calls it. Verse 17. Better start reading 16 first. And he says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. It's not like it was with Adam. You're not on probation. Okay, get that from chapter 5. You don't have a test that you have to meet or whatever. When you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, you're in the body of Christ and there is no probation. Religions today put you on a probationary program whereby you get saved, so to speak, and then you've got to stay saved by doing good things. Uh-uh. He says, and not as it was by one that sinned. It's not like that. So is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, that's Adam, but the free gift is of many offenses, yours, to, unto justification. Verse 17, now notice this verse. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, that's Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the what? Gift of righteousness. There it is. And he says, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offenses of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, Adam again, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Christ, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, what? Might abound. There's the condemnation of the law. But where sin abounded, what happened when it abounded? Grace did much more abound. Where do you find grace in the law of Moses? In the tabernacle. At the mercy seat, you see. And that sprinkling of that blood and what they went through with that sacrificial system was all pointing to this right here. That's all it was about. It was pointing to that. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And I guarantee you this, if blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, water can never take away sin. So don't ever let anybody ever fool you into believing that water baptism will save your soul or anything else other than the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that and that alone and nothing else. Now, the whole idea of teaching people that they can be justified by faith, that they can have security and assurance without any works to be saved or stay saved, that they are completely secure in Christ, that they have the comfort of knowing about sanctification, real godliness, which is this is probably one of the most important ones of all of them on the thing because this is where most of the Christians are plagued. This is where the Christians today are in the mud. Their wheels are spinning in the mud because they want to serve the Lord, they want to learn their Bibles, but they can't because the Bible publishers print all these corrupt Bibles and they can't figure them out. They can't have anything to trust. They don't know how to read a Bible that, that's so complicated and weird and strange and hard to read. The modern Bibles are not easier to read. They're harder to read. And they're more of a problem because they're corrupt. They take away and, 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 and corrupt the verses that help you with these things. You know, they destroy the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They destroy the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They destroy everything. And, and they can't get it because they, they, the Bible's been messed with, and the preachers can't preach out of those Bibles the truth because it's not there. <laughs> you see how this is working? And so as you begin to talk to people about sanctification and real godliness, they're interested. I talked to a man for 30 minutes yesterday, and he got so excited because the bulk of what we were talking about, he already agreed with. He gave me a great testimony, but it started out a little shaky, and I called him on it. And the way he was talking to me, it, it, it had more to do with the, just the terminology of what he was talking about that was a little bit confusing. So I, I understood that, and I, I realized then that his testimony was maybe not as being presented as clearly as it could. So I asked him straight up the question. And he gave me the answer. I said, I pointed to the T-shirt hanging on the wall, and I said, that's the message. He goes, that's what made me ask you the question. He started the conversation, by the way. 
<laughs> so I said, well, okay, great. <laughs> you know, thanks. Because when they open the door, that means I'm going to go through it. And if they don't like it, well, they shouldn't open the door. Okay? <laughs> That's the way I look at it. I, uh, I don't like to impose upon people's time. I know you think I'm a liar for saying that. <laughs> because I do impose upon your time sometimes. But I try to give you some back on occasion. But I will, I will tell you, we don't have a contract, okay? <laughs> uh, it, it's not that way, all right? But we try to keep it to an hour for you, all right? I know, what you, I, I know that when you sit there and listen to these things, it, it becomes, uh, there is a point where, you know, my pastor used to tell me, he says, Russ, their minds can only handle what their rear ends can endure. I said, okay, I understand, I get it. You know, we go to Bible conferences in Chicago and these people get up and I tell you what, they've been living out in, uh, you know, the sticks with no grace church. And they come to that conference and I mean, they are there early and they are staying afterwards talking to everybody they can. And they're ready for two, three hours of this. They'll get all they can get because they're storing it up like a squirrel because they got to take it home with them, you know. And thank God for the Internet and videos and all the other stuff they can take with them. It's, it's wonderful how as you begin to help people and, and teach them about all these different things, how wonderful it is how their life gets consumed with learning this and, and trying to apply it in their daily lives and seeing the fruit it bears. But just remember, there are people out there that don't have any of this and that don't know they're even, they don't even know how to be saved. And I, I do believe that the... the, the, the the most effective comfort that we could ever bring and use should be passed on. I'll close with this passage. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is really where we started. And we'll close out this subject today. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, you know, if you're going to have ministry, there has to be that impetus to drive it. And that, that driving motive is the grace of God in your own life. It's the, it's the fact that, hey, this is what I've got now. I cannot hold on to this. I've got to get it out. Verse uh, 3. Blessed be God. Uh, chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able... What? To comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Notice what Paul says in verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, that we were pressed, uh, he says, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death. There's that second death that the rich man was suffering, getting ready to suffer. He wasn't even in that part of it yet, but he, he, he's headed there. And doth deliver now. He delivers us now, doesn't he? Galatians chapter 1 says that Christ Jesus, you know, he came to do what? to deliver us from this present evil world. And the way he does that is teaching you all these things so that you don't have to worry about being in the world and of the world. You just be in your own little world. My world's great. The world around me, well, it stinks to high heaven, okay? But the problem is you've got to go out there and reach people. And, and as you see Paul doing this in his life, He's, he's so depressed, he's, he's despairing even of life. But he's trusting in God, and he says, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Where is that final one going to come? Well, right here. He's going to come back and get us personally. And when Paul, when Paul mentions that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the very last verse of that portion of that book that he reads that, where he writes that, he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Lord Jesus Christ hadn't forgotten you. He expects you to do your job. That's what he does. And he wants you to do your job and do it well and do it the way he wants you to do it so that when you go up into the heavenly places, you're going to bring glory to him. Okay? God wants him to have the glory. 
and so do we, right? And he's going to get it. Matter of fact, he's already got it. It's just a matter of displaying it. Guess what you're going to be? When you get the glory, you're going to be creatures, new creatures, that are on display. And that display will be the most glorious display you could ever possibly imagine. I don't know what it will look like to see many, many millions of saved people and glorified bodies all in one place at one time with the angelic host at their feet and at their disposal. My, yeah, my God is right. Thank you. Because that, that's what causes it all. <laughs> it's him that does it. And he does it through us. That's the beauty of real godliness, is it's him working through us. So when you, ever, you, when you stop on the road and your wheels are spinning, don't try to get yourself out of it. Go to the scriptures and study them and believe what they say and let him get you out of it, okay? This man yesterday, big bag of seeds were planted. And it wasn't just a couple. We, were, we, we, we did a whole row yesterday, okay? We had a long time, but it was good. And, and I tell you, I'm, I'm interested to see if he comes and studies with us. Everybody I talk to, I offer him to personally study with them. If you want to come to my store and study, we'll study, okay? You want to come here and study, we'll study, all right? And, and if you want to study the Bible, I'll not refuse you that. And if you want to learn the Bible, you can learn it. And if you have questions about it, it won't bother me if you question what I say to you. It won't offend me, and it won't make me mad. What I'll do is I'm going to say, okay, whoosh, let's go. <laughs> and we're going to mix it up. And you get your sword out, I'm going to get my sword out, and we're going to go at it, okay? And uh, guess who wins? God wins. That's right. The word of God wins every time. Nothing can be done against the truth but for the truth. And if Russ's position has to be whited out in his notes, so be it. Because I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to have the Bible square with my position. I'm trying to get my position to square with the book. And if I come across something that I find I don't even believe anymore, I have to, I have to recognize that. And if you can bring that to me and, and, and teach me, I'm okay with that because the Bible is profitable for correction. I'm all for it. The problem is there's no takers. I keep asking for people, and they, they don't show up. So you want to sum it up? There it is right there. The God of all comfort teaches us to go comfort the lost. Okay, and Start by doing those things with them. And you'll get so much comfort in your own life by doing it that you will be a happy person. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word.